tonight on CBC Vancouver News. That driller was unable to stop the flow of water, essentially left the job, took his equipment and left. A $10 million bill to fix a water leak. Why Vancouver taxpayers will end up getting soaked. Also tonight, deadly derailment. A CP freight train goes off the tracks, killing three crew members. And it's the difference between someone being alive and someone not. Seeking shelter as temperatures plunge in Metro Vancouver and the Fraser Valley. This is CBC Vancouver News. Good evening. It's a massive underground water leak and taxpayers are getting hosed to cover the repair bill. Work crews breached a huge aquifer at a residential construction site on Vancouver's west side. It happened more than three years ago, but it's still taking a toll on nearby homeowners. There's a lawsuit and charges against a drilling company, but as Bell Puri from our investigative unit reports, hopes of punishing those responsible and getting any money back appear to have gone down the drain. Stage set and ready to sell. Until people look over there. Next door, the remnants of a drilling disaster that caused the biggest ever aquifer breach in any major urban area in BC. More than three years later, the lot is still being monitored for leaks. Everybody asks about the next door. Everybody does, because it's very clear. They have to go through the kitchen. They see the outside window. In September 2015, owner Feng Lin Lu hired workers to install geothermal heating for a new home. The crew pierced the aquifer below. At its worst, the leak spilled nearly 2 million litres of groundwater a day. Geoenergia, a leader in the field of renewable energy. The energy firm in question boasts decades of experience and dozens of staff working on cutting-edge projects. Its Canadian arm in Port Coquitlam, though, was shut down within days of the breach. And the pair who ran it, Armando and Tommaso Machetti, are believed to have fled the country. The provincial government is going after the Italian drilling company and its two owners. They now face four charges under BC's Water Act for allegedly not being qualified to do the drilling. The city of Vancouver, meanwhile, has filed a lawsuit against the owner of the lot trying to recoup a $6.5 million chunk of its repair bill. The city is on the hook for $10 million in a bid to recoup some of the money the lot may be sold for its $4 million tax bill. It's a lot in the middle of a block in a residential neighbourhood. It's not typically where we'd use for a park. There still is access to the aquifer at that site. If the city needed access to the aquifer for emergency water supplies, that's one potential use of it. Much of Metro Vancouver sits on an aquifer. Experts say government mapping tools show the details. Qualified crews should be aware of that, especially when something goes wrong. If they don't immediately get it under control... Uh, some technical problems with that story. We'll try to get that uh, rectified and return to it in a bit. Well, questions tonight about what went wrong in the Rockies. Three crew members are dead after their freight train derailed and plummeted off a bridge. This is the scene rescue crews were called to in the early hours this morning. A westbound freight train toppled 60 meters off a bridge near the Alberta BC border. The workers' union claims it was a runaway train. It happened just east of Field, B.C., about 80 kilometers west of Banff. The three victims have been identified as trainee Daniel Waldenberger Balmer on the left, engineer Andrew Dockrell in the center, and conductor Dylan Parody on the right. The CBC's Anis Heydari is at the scene and has this report. The derailment happened around 1 a.m. Mountain Time. The three crew members were on board the train, Two of their bodies were found outside the locomotive after the derailment. One of them was still inside. We're told they're a conductor, an engineer, and a conductor trainee based out of Calgary. Between 30 to 40 rail cars carrying grain went off the tracks. And while Canadian Pacific has been keeping anyone not involved in the investigation away, I was able to get to a vantage point to see at least half a dozen railway cars mangled beyond recognition. You can only tell what they were from some of the railway logos on them and from the old Canadian wheat board markings. RCMP and Transportation Safety Board investigators are responding, but you can't get to this scene by road. We've seen dozens of semis, and they are taking Canadian Pacific emergency response trailers, backhoes, and even snowmobiles to the scene so that responders can get there. Now, the railway says there's no threat to public safety and dangerous goods weren't involved. 
The union says there have been eight deaths on Canadian railways since November 2017. As for the Transportation Safety Board, they'll have more to say about this tomorrow. Ani Sadari, CBC News, Field, BC. The transit officer shot at Scott Road Sky train station last week in Surrey is getting ready to undergo surgery. Constable Josh Harms suffered non-life-threatening injuries. Today, the 27-year-old is thanking his colleagues, his treatment staff, and the general public, saying, I thank God my injuries were not worse and that he will make a full recovery before getting back to work. He had serious injuries, has serious injuries, um, but he's doing amazingly well given the circumstances. Um, he was in good spirits. Um, he had a genuine concern for his co-workers, um, which, you know, if, if you knew Constable Harms, it just speaks to his character. Constable Harms is scheduled for surgery later this week. There has been an increase in traffic at open houses, according to the Real Estate Board of Greater Vancouver, but that's still not translating into sales. 1,103 homes sold in Metro Vancouver in January. That's down 40% for the same month a year ago. And that's with 55% more homes listed for sale. A possible reason, there hasn't been a significant drop in prices. Overall, residential home prices decreased by 4.5% compared to the same time last year at just over a million dollars. But that was buoyed in large part by a 9.1% decrease in detached homes. Both townhouse and apartment prices dropped less than 2% each year. An Arctic air mass over the south coast has made for a cold, cold day. With the Fraser Valley being hit the hardest, temperatures dropped to minus 9 with a wind chill of minus 20 in some parts. And while that's caused some big disruptions like power outages and frozen pipes, our Leanne Young is finding some aren't bothered by the chilly temperatures at all. It might be sunny out, but this isn't exactly ideal weather to be working outside. It's too cold. It's like a minus 15, I told you. With the wind chill, temperatures are downright frigid in the Fraser Valley as a ridge of Arctic air has swept across the lower mainland. Crews are still cleaning up after yesterday's snowstorm as dozens of cars piled up on Highway 1 and thousands lost power, some still without it. And today, three Abbotsford schools were forced to close. It's a hectic time for plumbers like Jason Sperandio. We get pretty busy. We get a lot of no heat calls and uh, staff would grab one of the mats. At Vancouver's Salvation have, Army uh, Belkin House, Les McCoslin is getting ready to help those without a home stay warm. He's preparing a 15-bed temporary shelter for tonight. During extreme weather, I mean, it, it's the difference between someone being alive and someone not. When Vancouver's three other shelters fill up, they will open their doors. Down at English Bay, temperatures hovered below the freezing mark, but you wouldn't know it from this seaside picnic. We love beaches, that's why. But it is so cold outside, no? No, it's... It's okay here, like the weather is a kind of okay, the sun is shining, everything's okay. It's okay enough that others decided to dive right in. Guys, how's the water out there? Refreshing. This is the coldest day of the year, of the winter. <laughs> oh, really? We nailed it then. <laughs> Time to, yeah. Could have been better. It's not apparently not so bad when you live two blocks sauna. away and can hit the sauna after. Uh, there's certainly a chill in the air, but underneath the clear skies with all of the sunshine, it almost feels a touch warm, dare I say. But if you enjoy this type of weather, then you're in for a treat. The forecast is calling for more cold and clear conditions over the next couple of days. Leanne Young, CBC News, Vancouver. Something you'd see any of us do, I don't think. Nope. No. <laughs> Mini polar bears swim there. Yeah. Johanna Wagstaff is here now with the first look at the weather. And Johanna, I mean, I've been talking to people out there today, especially out in the Fraser Valley, and it is downright chilly. Uh, you can say that again. Yeah, we are breaking records, a good 10 to 20 degrees below seasonal. And yes, this was our coldest day of the year for most of the south coast. And that goes for daytime highs and overnight lows and those wind chills because those winds were coming in pretty fiercely this morning. I want to show you pictures out of Victoria, uh, not swimming in the water, but frozen water uh, downtown. Beautiful sight in uh, downtown Victoria, uh, where temperatures were also at their coldest this morning with a wind chill minus 15. Uh, people out and about enjoying the sights, but certainly 
bundled up in several layers. I want to show you the temperatures here right now. Uh, we do have a bit of a wind chill tonight. The winds are easing over the next couple of days. Here's what it looks like outside. Minus two at YVR, but more like a minus eight out towards Hope. And the closer you get to the mouth of a valley or an inlet, uh, that's where the winds are racing from the east towards the coast. That's where you're going to feel those colder temperatures and going to feel more of a wind chill through the morning hours. You can see on the satellite and radar, it is pretty clear across most of the province. That's going to mean those overnight lows will drop uh, quite substantially. Tonight could be our coldest night, uh, even compared to last night. The extreme cold warnings, though, really just in place for the Peace region. We are seeing a general warm up over the next couple of days, but still below seasonal. So I'll take you through what will be a very chilly long range and see if we can uh, find any more snow for you, Anita, coming up. <laughs> Looking forward to it. Thanks, Joanna. <laughs> You're welcome. This weather update is brought to you by your local REMAX agent. The experience, the tools, the know-how. That's the sign of a REMAX agent. And a fresh reminder tonight to stick to the approved travel routes in the BC interior. Eight people had to be rescued over the weekend when they drove off road to get around a landslide. Highway 97 is still closed in both directions north of Summerland due to a significant amount of rock that's fallen since Saturday. So much, in fact, officials say they could fill a couple of Olympic sized swimming pools. This afternoon, crews started using explosives to remove the rest of the unstable rock. They say the road will reopen as soon as it's safe. Rescue crews say on the weekend, some drivers use their own GPS systems to find an alternate route before getting stranded in the backcountry. After two recent killings in Kamloops linked to organized crime, BC's gang task force has seized a large amount of drugs, weapons and money. Over four days, the unit conducted spot checks, stopping 132 people. Officers seized 21 knives, four sets of brass knuckles, 12 axes and hatches, suspected cocaine, crystal meth, and potentially deadly fentanyl. They also took roughly $40,000 in cash, believed to be directly tied to the drug trade and drug-related activities. The specialized unit says it regularly deploys to communities around the province to provide short-term support to police agencies. After six years of waiting, an assault victim saw the man responsible sentenced in a Port Coquitlam courtroom today. And as Zara Premji reports, it was just one of the many trials the North Okanagan man will face this year on charges involving violence and sex workers. What was supposed to be the start of a five-day trial for Curtis Sagmoen turned into a guilty plea and sentencing. He entered the courtroom wearing an orange prison jumpsuit, and when offered by the judge to address the courtroom, he said no. The trial was for an offense that happened six years ago. It involved Sagmoen connecting with the woman advertising as a massage escort on Craigslist. The victim went to Sagmoen's home in Maple Ridge in 2013, and he assaulted her during a dispute over payment. She then suffered injuries to the back of her head, the defense saying it was the result of a shove into a coffee table. Sagmoen pled not guilty to assault causing bodily harm in relation to assaulting that sex trade worker, but ended up pleading guilty to a lesser charge of simple assault, which is when protesters erupted in the courtroom with the words, no more stolen sisters and shame. The judge sentenced Segmo into 30 days in jail, but because of credit from pre-sentence custody, it amounts to time served. The judge also ordered he serve two years of probation, including no contact with the victim. Segmon has been in custody since he was arrested in October 2017 and now remains there on numerous other charges involving allegedly threatening and assaulting sex trade workers. He'll be back in court later this month in Vernon for more charges, including assault, and then again back in September for another trial. Zara Premji, CBC News, Vancouver. An arrest has been made following reports that a young man exposed himself to a 10-year-old girl. The case dates back to early January. RCMP say the girl was walking near Sullivan Heights Elementary when the man grabbed her, threw her to the ground, and exposed himself. She screamed. He ran off. Mounties now say a 19-year-old has been identified and arrested in relation to the case. No charges have been laid, but the investigation is ongoing. At day one of Jamie Bacon's trial here in Vancouver, a jury has heard the first details of a drug trade partnership that allegedly led to an attempted murder. 
Bacon is charged with counseling an associate to kill his drug trade partner, Dennis Karbovnik. The Crown says Bacon masterminded the attempted murder in 2008 and recruited a man who owed him money to carry it out. We can't tell you that man's name. He can only be identified as C.D. It's part of a number of publication bans for this case. The trial is expected to continue over the next 10 weeks. Well, if you've got a story idea to share with us, you can send it directly to us. CBC News, Vancouver at cbc.ca. You can also contact us on Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram. We are CBC Vancouver on each platform, and you'll also find us streaming this show live and on demand on both Facebook and YouTube commercial free. He gave up his seat on an overbooked Air Canada flight in exchange for compensation. Coming up, what the airline offered and what this passenger ended up getting. Well, if you're watching online, good evening to you. Over the weekend, our John Hernandez was speaking with members of Vancouver's Filipino community. Yeah, they're rallying behind a Richmond man diagnosed with two rare forms of leukemia. John spoke to the man about what his treatment options are. I'm kind of subconsciously counting down how much time I have left, which apparently is not that much. Left. Martin Lintag is in a race against time. He was diagnosed with two types of blood cancer last summer just after his 30th birthday. My mind was kind of a standstill. I was kind of a blur at the same time. It's like, wow, am I going to die? Or what happens next? Or like, what do I do now? Like, it was just, it was like paralyzing. Six months later, he's still grappling with those same questions. He's gone through chemotherapy and other forms of treatment, but they've been hard on his body. And on Thursday, he found out the cancer isn't going away. Doctors have given him three months to a year to live. Right now, I'm going off the beaten path, looking for second opinions and alternative forms of therapy, and I've been scrambling to find um, other routes, like clinical trials and whatnot. If he can somehow achieve remission, he'll need a stem cell donation to survive. But there's no matching donors on the registry. You only find matches within your own ethnic group, uh, but in Martin's case, he is Filipino. Uh, that is about 1% of our database, just under. So. You know, you're looking for a needle in a haystack, and for some communities, that haystack is a lot smaller. The hurdles will be tough to overcome, but friends and family are trying to make things easier. Volunteers organized this stem cell swab at Vancouver's Croatian Cultural Center, inviting people of similar backgrounds to have their cells tested in hopes of finding a match. Honestly, if, if I were to match with anyone, I would I would be more than willing to donate. Because, like, if, if my health could save a life, like, why not? If we can help out in any way, that would be such a privilege for us. Blood Services says finding a match is like winning the lottery. But campaigns like this have been successful in the past, offering some much needed hope. It, it's really encouraging um, that like uh, that I'm not alone in this fight and it's really it helps me just uh, helps me just to stay sane basically. Canadian Blood Services is urging more people to register so Lintag and many other patients like him can get a second chance. John Hernandez CBC News Vancouver. Always a challenge when you're of a certain ethnic community mm -hmm. to find a match. If you do have leukemia, we hear a lot of stories like that. And well, see what happens going forward there mm -hmm. for sure. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, we're always looking to do more stories about what's happening in your community. In addition to contacting our newsroom, you can always get in touch with us directly on Twitter. Yes, message us at Anita Bath or Mike underscore Colleen. And we can talk about your story ideas more in depth. We'd love to hear from you. And we will be back with more news in just a few moments. He volunteered to give up his seat on an overcrowded flight, but a Toronto business professor is learning no good deed goes unpunished. That's because Air Canada backtracked on the compensation he was promised. Erica Johnson of our Go Public unit has the story. Every customer experience matters. Daniel Chai is teaching his business students about customer service, a lesson he created after a recent experience with Air Canada. It's all about trusting and respecting your customers. 
He was traveling from Vancouver to Toronto, but his flight was overcrowded. It was just pandemonium. There were people sitting on the floor. There were babies crying. It was, the whole place was just full of people. Chai says he volunteered to give up his seat and take a later flight in exchange for a $600 voucher, which he says was increased to $800 later that day. And I thought, wow, this is a great gesture by Air Canada. They stepped up. They're really rewarding people for voluntarily giving up their seats, as they should. But when Air Canada emailed him the next day, it offered only a 15% discount off a future flight, not $800. I think that's just wrong. Uh, as, as a business professor, I consider that to be uh, a marketing fail. This is what you're not supposed to do when you treat customers. After he pushed back in an email, Air Canada replied offering on an exceptional basis a $300 coupon as a goodwill gesture. But an expert in contract law says a verbal promise, in this case for $800, is a binding contract. The airline offered up compensation. The passenger accepted it. Uh, it's not open to the airline to say, well, we don't really like that deal anymore, and so we'd like to change it. This air passenger rights advocate says giving up your seat on an overcrowded flight can be risky. I generally recommend passengers not to volunteer to give up their seats because we hear too many cases like this one where air passengers have difficulty then getting the compensation they were promised. Air Canada declined an interview request, but after Go Public contacted the airline, it did send Daniel Chai another voucher, this one for $500, adding up to the $800 he says he was owed. Erica Johnson, CPC News, Vancouver. It has been a rocky first year for Loblaw's PC Optimum program. Reward card customer complaints continue over lost or stolen points. As Yvonne Colbert reports, in some cases that means hundreds of dollars worth of points in limbo. Since Loblaws merged shoppers and PC cards into the PC Optimum card, there have been complaints about missing and stolen points. One year later, it's still happening. Gary Smith in Bridgewater lost $240 worth of points in November, stolen and used by someone in Quebec. He still doesn't know how the culprit accessed his card. Halifax resident Robin Arsenault discovered $150 worth of missing points when someone linked to her card. And at the other end of the country, in Vancouver, Jennifer White has spent almost a year attempting to get her points back. They were closing my inquiry because they said the points had been spent. Uh, I know I've been trying to get uh, further follow-up information from them regarding uh, when and where the points have been spent. Uh, they've told me they cannot investigate further because the case had been opened uh, longer than 45 days ago. Loblaws, which owns PC Optimum, says it can only go back 45 days on accounts. Despite that, all three finally got their points back. Gary Smith says he had to call every week. Robin Arsenault's points were returned after CBC brought her story to Loblaws' attention. And just last week, Jennifer White got her points back after almost a year of trying. All say customer service leaves a lot to be desired with promises of return calls that never materialized. It seems scammers are somehow linking themselves to PC Optimum cards, then stealing points. But a Loblaw spokesperson says that is rare. She says the program has strong security measures and the company is constantly improving them. She says anyone missing points should contact them right away. Jennifer White in Vancouver has her own suggestion. She says spend those points. That way scammers can't steal them and you avoid a lot of stress trying to get your points back. Yvonne Colbert, CBC News, Halifax. Well, a group that makes the Canadian Heritage Minutes videos wants an apology from the Conservative Party. It's upset about a political ad aimed at Justin Trudeau and the Liberals. In over 150 years, Canada has had many Prime Ministers. Justin Trudeau had made history, unfortunately. The Conservative spoof was made in a similar style to Historica Canada's mini history videos. A nonprofit group says it welcomes parodies but does not want them used for partisan political purposes. The video was taken down but then reposted with a message stating it's a parody. Historica says even with a disclaimer, the Conservative ad runs counter to the spirit of the minutes.
To Toronto now, where tears and anger filled a courtroom as the sentencing hearing for Bruce MacArthur began. Last week, the 67-year-old had admitted to killing eight men who vanished between 2010 and 2017. The hearing revealed more about what happened to the victims and how their killer was caught. But first, a warning. Some of the details in this report are pretty graphic and disturbing. John Lancaster has more. For seven years, a killer preyed on men in Toronto's gay village. One by one, these eight men vanished without a trace between 2010 and 2017. Then came a break. These security cameras captured partially obscured images of an older model red minivan with unique trim pulling up outside the home of Andrew Kinsman. The 49-year-old man got inside and was never seen again. Inside his apartment, a clue though, the name Bruce penciled in on the day of the disappearance. As friends and family searched for Kinsmen, police used a Ministry of Transportation database to narrow down the owners of similar red minivans whose first names were Bruce. MacArthur's name stood out due to his previous run-ins with police over allegations of domestic violence. His vehicle was found weeks later in a wreckers yard. Inside, DNA belonging to MacArthur and several of the missing men. A search of MacArthur's apartment revealed another trove of evidence, a kit containing duct tape, ties, and syringes, and hundreds of pictures, some of kinsmen from years earlier when the two were friends, and worse, so-called staged photos of the dead, missing men, wearing this fur coat and fur hat. Hearing what I heard, it was gruesome and it was detailed, but then again, these these um, family members and friends and colleagues needed to know. The courtroom was told it was likely all of the men were strangled. But the court heard how MacArthur slipped through the hands of police twice before being caught. In 2013, he was questioned after Majid Kayan disappeared. And in 2016, a man called 911 claiming MacArthur had tried to strangle him. In both cases, MacArthur was released. Many of the men had met MacArthur through dating apps. At least two were never reported missing. One was homeless, the other living underground for fear of deportation. Police later found what little they had, pieces of jewelry, in MacArthur's apartment. Now it's left a, an, you know, an aura of distrust within the community of people and, and dating and relationships and talking about the mental and physical strains that it has put on people. People are, are hesitant to go out. John Lancaster, CBC News, Toronto. How a centuries-old Chinese tradition is evolving, now faced with modern realities, Coming up, we look at dragon and lion dances and their role in Lunar New Year celebrations.
Here are some of the stories we're following tonight on CBC Vancouver News at 6. There was no contract in place between the owner and the driller. The driller may or may not have been insured. In any case, uh, that company took off. Vancouver taxpayers are getting hosed with a $10 million bill to fix a massive underground water leak. Work crews breached a huge aquifer at a residential construction site on Vancouver's west side. It happened more than three years ago, but it's still taking a toll on nearby homeowners. There are charges against a drilling company. Three CP rail workers have been killed after a train derailed near Field, B.C. It plunged more than 60 meters from a bridge near the Alberta, B.C. border early this morning. The union claims it was a runaway train. And our Dan Burt has been following developments in this story tonight. Dan, what do we know about the victims? Anita and Mike, these three men were inside that train when it went off the tracks. CP Rail says conductor trainee Daniel Waldenberger Bulmer on the left. In the center, engineer Andrew Dockerell and conductor Dylan Parody on the right were killed when the westbound freight train went off those tracks around midnight Pacific time. It was pulling 112 cars. Two of the dead crew members were found near the locomotive after it landed in the Kicking Horse River. The third was still inside. That crash left massive rail cars mangled and smashed, as you can see. CP says no dangerous goods were on board. And that's what we have right now. Well, the, big, the big question tonight, Dan, is why this happened. What is the latest on the investigation? Well, you hinted at it uh, earlier, Anita. A cause has not been confirmed, but the Teamsters Union says it does know a crucial piece of information. Have a listen. I can confirm reports that the uh, train involved in the derailment was in fact a runaway train. Uh, however, details at this stage are still sparse and I think it's important that we let the uh, Transportation Safety Board investigators do their job. Now another Teamsters official we spoke to says speed was a factor in this crash and claims the speed limit in that area is between 24 and 32 kilometers an hour. Let's remind you where this was. The TSB has investigators heading to the scene. While Mounties, the coroner and the Employment St Safety Standards Canada are also helping, it happened near field in a very remote area just west of Banff, Alberta and Yoho National Park. The TSB notes you can only get to the site by rail. You can't drive there, so there is a lot of work ahead of them. Dan Burrett, thank you. Well, it's a massive underground water leak, and taxpayers are getting hosed to cover the repair bill. More than three years after work crews breached a huge aquifer at a residential construction site on Vancouver's west side, homeowners are still feeling the toll. There's a lawsuit and charges against a drilling company, but as Bell Peary reports, hopes of punishing those responsible and getting any money back have dwindled. Stage set and ready to sell. Until people look over there. Next door, the remnants of a drilling disaster that caused the biggest ever aquifer breach in any major urban area in BC. More than three years later, the lot is still being monitored for leaks. Everybody asks about the next door. Everybody does, because it's very clear. They have to go through the kitchen. They see the outside window. In September 2015, owner Feng Lin Lu hired workers to install geothermal heating for a new home. The crew pierced the aquifer below. At its worst, the leak spilled nearly 2 million litres of groundwater a day. Geoenergia, a leader in the field of renewable energy. The energy firm in question boasts decades of experience and dozens of staff working on cutting-edge projects. Its Canadian arm in Port Coquitlam, though, was shut down within days of the breach. And the pair who ran it, Armando and Tommaso Machetti, are believed to have fled the country. The provincial government is going after the Italian drilling company and its two owners. They now face four charges under BC's Water Act for allegedly not being qualified to do the drilling. The city of Vancouver, meanwhile, has filed a lawsuit against the owner of the lot, trying to recoup a $6.5 million chunk of its repair bill. The city is on the hook for $10 million in a bid to recoup some of the money the lot may be sold for its $4 million tax bill. It's a lot in the middle of a block in a residential neighborhood. It's not typically where we'd use for a park. There still is access to the aquifer at that site. If the city needed access to the aquifer for emergency water supplies, that's one potential use of it. Much of Metro Vancouver sits on an aquifer. Experts say government mapping tools show the details. 
Qualified crews should be aware of that, especially when something goes wrong. If they don't immediately get it under control, if they drill deeper, uh, if they uh, haven't been properly trained for what to do when a situation like this occurs, then things get out of hand and it is very difficult to control. On Beechwood Street, it's alleged the crew made a rookie mistake and pulled the very device needed to plug the problem. Fears of a potential sinkhole swallowing up to a dozen homes led to evacuation alerts. Edward Jang's clients never came back. The house remained empty. He feels the owners should be compensated. If you were to rent a home like this in the area, it would cost at least $7,000. That would be at least $84,000 a year. They have to pay the bills, they have to pay the tax, they have to pay the vacant home tax. The city hasn't heard from the property owner for over a year, and CBC attempts to contact the drilling company have failed. Going after either for compensation may prove to be even messier than the leak. Belle Puri, CBC News, Vancouver. Well, they're loud, they're colorful, and they're a key part of Lunar New Year celebrations. Dagon and lion dances are centuries-old Chinese traditions that usher in good luck. And all week, you're going to see a number of them around town. But as our Leanne Young reports, like many old traditions, this one has had to evolve with modern realities. With the beat of the drum, it begins. The mythical dragon, a unicorn of the skies, brought to life. But this is just practice. Kick out, kick out, kick out. Chinatown's historical Han Sing Athletic Club is days away from its grand performance at Vancouver's Spring Festival Parade. It's a tradition that Han Sing has been maintaining, not just for the last 80 years, but even uh, earlier, I've been told, before Han Sing was actually officially founded. Danny Kwan's father introduced him to the martial arts group when he was just eight years old. He practiced under Kung Fu master Peter Wong. Now he's become the teacher, and a lot has changed since then. The club itself has remained true to what it was when it was formed in 1939. It's the outside community that's changed, and that's kind of made us realize that we have to change along with it too. It's really hard it, nowadays because the, you know, computer, <laughs> cell phone, you know, and the kids are not as concentrated as it used to be. Those modern developments have left membership numbers dwindling, and the battle for attention is constant. This is the boss which is helping us to keep things real here at Han Sing, uh, the Han Sing cell phone storage. Now every class starts with a new tradition, a roundup of sorts. The Han Sing Athletic Club has 35 active members today. Back in the 1960s and 70s at its peak, there were over 200. And while rehearsals have ramped up now as we head towards the Lunar New Year, recruitment for the club takes place year-round. Classes are free on purpose, and now everyone is welcome. Women and men, and not just Chinese Canadians, like 19-year-old Terry Lam, whose parents are Vietnamese Chinese. I really didn't know anything about my Chinese heritage. So coming up here, I really felt like half of my identity was filled up because this club really educated me on what I was missing out. Lessons Quan hopes won't ever get lost. Duty, honor, tradition, and culture. No matter how much the times change. Leanne Young, CBC News, Vancouver. 6.39 on this chilly Monday evening. There was a live shot, the lights of uh, Gross Mountain in behind Harbor Center. These freezing temperatures are sticking around for the next few days, but will we get more snow here on the south coast? Johanna's forecast is next.
Well, with most of Alberta under an extreme cold warning, bundling up to ward off frostbite, well, it's kind of a no-brainer. Uh, except for this group of runners in Calgary, they decided to embrace the cold for a good cause, hitting the road for a sub-zero sprint with a twist. CBC's Anise Hidari has this story. There are cheers as these people start running in minus 26 degrees Celsius. Maybe that's my question. Are you crazy? Uh, I might be. I don't know. Does a crazy person know they're crazy? <laughs> Travis Burdell was one of around two dozen runners who decided they don't need shirts to run. They were all participating in the Calgary Exposed 5K. We're not crazy, and I think if people expose themselves to the cold, I, I think they'll understand that. Nathaniel Ernst is a personal trainer, and he organized the run. He's done the shirtless cold running thing for years now. And he says it's not as bad as you think. We had a lot of runners at the start that thought it was absolutely crazy. And the response that we got when we did the training runs was, oh, it's actually not that bad. The event was a fundraiser for homeless shelter in from the cold, a name that definitely held meaning in minus 26 temperatures. And that's before the wind chill. We thought that the homeless don't have a choice uh, whether it's going to be cold outside or not. And when it is, a lot of them don't have a place to go. Despite the frigid conditions, they raised more than $30,000. And he said, Ari, CBC News, Calgary. Forget Ooh. the sunburn. That cold burn looks painful. Their skin was, they were actually pink because yeah. of how cold All it was. All for the cause, though. You're All right. All for the cause. Respect. Yeah. Mad yeah. respect. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wouldn't even do that in our temperatures. No. 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 And yeah. I wouldn't say they were balmy, but they are definitely not quite uh, Alberta temperatures, even with the uh, sub-zero Arctic chill we're feeling. Let me take you through the time lapse. It was quite the change to the snow we had yesterday, this morning. It was lovely to see those flakes. Uh, those who weren't inconvenienced by it anyway, I know a lot of you got out to enjoy our first dusting, I'll call it, of the year across Metro Vancouver, 2 to 10 centimeters for the south coast. But this morning, blue skies behind that Pacific system that's now sunk to the south, and we're just left with that Arctic air. A big picture for wind chills tonight, still dealing with very cold wind chills across a huge swath of North America. Nice little warm up in through the Great Lakes. I say nice, but that moisture is colliding with that cold air so freezing rain a big story in through parts of eastern Ontario and southern Quebec tonight the western edge of that arctic front has pushed into British Columbia the actual polar vortex that area of circulation that normally hangs around the arctic that's just the white areas so it has retreated a little bit we're still well below seasonal across a huge swath of the country but not quite as dramatic as last week that being said we're getting into that outflow and that is our setup for the coldest air we really never get into the heart of the arctic air across the south coast what we do get is a modified version as a cold air filters towards the coast through the inlets and valleys and racing often as we see it uh, the reason why we saw such gusty winds at the uh, bottom of house sound uh, the reason why so many ferries were cancelled this morning because of those outflow winds taking you through the overnight and you can see not much in the way of cloud or precip. Uh, I think it's going to be an all blue sky day tomorrow, and I think we can keep it going through most of our Wednesday as well. Taking you down to a minus eight tonight. So tomorrow morning for much of Metro Vancouver, that means wind chills, especially if you get those outflow winds, close to minus 13, minus 15. It is going to be colder for parts of Metro Vancouver uh, tomorrow morning than it was last night. I think this will probably be our coldest night so far of the season. Back up to a minus two, so similar temperatures, but I don't think we'll see quite the winds that we saw yesterday. So afternoon wind chills might not be quite as severe for the Fraser Valley. But high pressure is keeping that Arctic air locked in place for the long range. I do see a bit of a recovery over the next couple of days. We're talking creeping up closer to the freezing mark, uh, not very close to our seasonal, which is six or seven degrees for this time of the year. And watch the system that slides in from the northwest. That's going to be our next weather maker. We were talking about this late last week that the next chance of snow may be for Thursday. At this point, doesn't look like it'll be a big event as it taps into some very dry air. And I do have some very cool temperatures to take you through. Uh, this is your long range forecast. Minus two tomorrow, just a minus one on Wednesday. Creeping back above the freezing mark for the end of the week. You can see I've got a few flakes flying on Thursday and I'll keep my eye on that in case anything changes because when it comes to snow in Vancouver, a lot can change last minute. But at this point, it looks just like a light dusting at best. Okay. And get out the blankets at night for those cool temperatures. Yeah. Blankets and more, for sure. Mm -hmm. <laughs> All right, thanks very much. Nice job. You're welcome.
This weather update is brought to you by your local REMAX agent. The experience, the tools, the know-how. That's the sign of a REMAX agent. Coming up, we take you to Venezuela to show you firsthand how the political crisis is crushing its people and what Canada is doing to help. Hi, I'm Amy Bell, and here's what's in your CBC Vancouver inbox. Join Mike Colleen at the SFU Surrey Presidents Gala on March 1st. Learn about innovative education and research in BC's fastest growing region. And celebrate International Women's Day and get inspired with Gloria Makarenko at West Coast Leafs Equality Breakfast. Get your tickets today. For more on these events, check us out at cbc.ca slash bc. Canada is officially recognizing Venezuelan opposition leader Juan Guaido as that country's interim president. Prime Minister Trudeau made the remarks at the opening of an emergency meeting of Lima Group allies. He also announced $53 million in humanitarian assistance for Venezuelan refugees. We know that the people of Venezuela are facing tremendous hardship and they need our help as do the countries who have taken in those fleeing violence. Officials from the Americas and Europe are in Ottawa to discuss their opposition to the regime of Nicolas Maduro. Protests have erupted across Venezuela since he began his second term January 10th. Many nations, including Canada, have deemed that vote illegitimate. Meanwhile, pressure for Nicolas Maduro to step down is also mounting inside the country. As more members of the military have started to turn their backs on him, CBC's Adrian Arsenault has more. He is surely trying Nicolas Maduro at military exercises today, partly encouraging, partly lecturing troops about loyalty, commanding it, getting his own medal, it seems. Leales siempre, traidores nunca. Traidores nunca. Maduro needs Venezuelans and those in the international community to see these moments and believe his strength endures, that his presidency endures. Certainly his language was all about control. Ellos dicen que en Venezuela va a haber una guerra civil. 
ni intervención, ni guerra civil. Venezuela va a haber paz. Y esa paz la vamos a garantizar con la Unión Cívico-Militar. Paz. Nuestra victoria va a ser la paz. But will it? This weekend saw the highest profile defection so far. This Air Force general who urged his fellow officers to switch sides. El 90% de la Fuerza Armada Nacional Obrera no está con el dictador, está con el pueblo de Venezuela. There's a bit of a show in this as well. This general was in a planning role, didn't command any forces of his own. But a few lower ranking officers still followed his lead. Mi general, mis respetos. And that will make Venezuelan leaders with long memories wince because the Air Force has history here. A rebel helicopter fired on the presidential palace before it was shot out of the sky by an army gunship. It attempted a coup here decades ago, leading to a dogfight in the skies before a rebel fighter was shot down. So now Maduro must fear the skies and the streets. The sea of opposition strength yesterday was breathtaking. Rallies stretched beyond Caracas to towns and cities far from traditional anti-government hotspots, places where rallies have not been common. And for all the anxiety of bloody crackdowns in those streets, instead, security forces backed off, even hugged protesters, either didn't have the heart to go after their own neighbors and friends or realize the tide is turning. That's the version of the future Juan Guaido wants to believe in. He insists he is now president, and every day more nations agree. Canada was one of the first to stand by him. Que ya tenemos tres puntos de acopio para la ayuda humanitaria. His power building, his voice disappearing, he maintained he would arrange for relief shipments into Venezuela. Interesting play. It would force the military to choose, accept the aid and stand by Guaido, or block it and align with Maduro. The U.S. National Security Advisor said the aid is being transported right now. Donald Trump suggesting intervention doesn't have to stop there. What would make you use the U.S. military in Venezuela? What's the national security Well, I don't want to interest? say that, but certainly it's something that's on the, uh, it's an option. So what will Washington do? What will Maduro's allies, Russia and China, do? What can Venezuelans do? These are obsessive questions here, and almost all the answers are dangerous. You can't forget Venezuelans have allowed themselves to believe in change before, and they've been disappointed before. But they will tell you this feels different, and this week feels important. In Venezuela, I'm Adrian Arsenault. It's the eve of Chinese New Year. Coming up, a colorful tradition it's helping light the way to the year of the rat.
Tuesday on the early edition, we'll continue our celebrations of Lunar New Year when we speak with local author Jen Sukfong Lee about the animals of the Chinese zodiac and the pig in particular. That's tomorrow on the early edition, beginning at 5 a.m. Well, tomorrow's the start of the Lunar New Year. We head into the year of the pig. Not the rat. So somebody said rat earlier, <laughs> and he apologizes uh -huh. deeply for that mistake. Yes, the year of the pig, and of course the Lunar New Year, a tradition uh, to mark the occasion with lanterns. Mm -hmm. I won't forget, because this is my year, yes. as a uh, year of the pig. Uh, uh -huh. One of the largest lantern installations is at Jackpool Plaza, and as one of the organizers explains, it was dreamed up with some help of local indigenous groups. Take a listen. It is not uh, very often that you're able to celebrate uh, the Lunar New Year and kind of meld and merge that together with uh, a rich history uh, on the unceded territory of the uh, Coast Salish nations. We blended the two um, cultures together and created uh, this magnificent uh, piece that you see behind us. So tourists in Vancouver really wanted to create something iconic uh, as well as we did, want to create something iconic that you can only see in Vancouver. Each lantern is actually 10 feet tall and 3 feet in diameter. So, and the truss structure is about 20 feet off the ground. Having it on uh, the, in, with this iconic background is something that uh, the artists were very excited to uh, have. Uh, their art displayed against. Going way back, it, it was a way for in China to signal uh, times of war or uh, as a signaling point, but then with more traditional like for festivals and things like that, um, in Taiwan there's actually a lantern festival where people would actually create these lanterns, write their wishes on it, and then they would actually uh, light a flame underneath and it would actually go into the air. It is like prosperity, a, a way to wish for good luck and good fortune for the year to come. We created something that literally cannot be missed and it is something that you have to come to see for yourself to truly experience uh, the grandeur and how how beautiful it is. Very nice. nice. Mm -hmm. After to take a look. Mm -hmm. Yes. All right, Super Bowl 53 made history in Atlanta last night, but not for the reasons you'd expect. That's right. The game earned the dubious distinction of being the lowest scoring in Super Bowl NFL history. From the two, first and goal. Running it for the touchdown. Sony Michelle. Well, that was the lone touchdown in last night's Super Bowl 53. The New England Patriots beat the Los Angeles Rams 13 to 3 to win their sixth championship. That ties the Pittsburgh Steelers for the most Super Bowl wins by any NFL franchise. And of course, uh, most controversy, as always, is about the halftime show. Oh, yeah. Always. <laughs> Maroon 5. Yeah. Well, shirt shirtless, removal there. Yes. Adam Not removal. a wardrobe malfunction this time. No, but. Did you guys uh, watch the game? Yes. Yeah. yeah. Oh, yeah. You? Yeah. Uh, I fell I'm asleep. I'm so glad times. I gave the highlights because I did not. <laughs> <laughs> that, was one, oh, that was one of <laughs> have, have a good night. Dan Burt will be back here at 11 o'clock with your next local news. Good night.